Thank you everyone for coming today. I know it seems uh, small that we just have three graduates, but these three people have worked very hard and it's an honor. And this is a joint commencement between Christ the Teacher Seminary and St. Anthony School of Biblical Theology of the Evangelical Orthodox Catholic Church. So again, this is a day of honor for these three individuals who have worked very hard. Um, now I will turn it over to Archabbot Anthony and we'll say an opening prayer. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we are so thankful that you are here with us. You have said, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. And we thank you, Lord, that your love as shown through our Lord Jesus Christ and through the many, many trials that we've gone through and the trials and tribulations of the students that work so hard to receive their, their recognition today. May this recognition that we give to them be one that becomes practical for them as they go out and serve in doing the will of God uh, amongst men and women everywhere. May Jesus Christ be praised. We thank you for the wonderful guests that we have here today. We honor them as well. And we are honored with your presence. And we would thank you, Lord, for all of this grace that you give to us in the small ways and in the big ways. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay. We do want to welcome everyone here today. It's uh, such a pleasure to, uh, to see so many new faces, uh, people that, uh, that I don't know, but I had an opportunity to, to meet just a while ago up in the chapel. Bishop Chancellor, graduates, and distinguished guests here today. It's good to be here. I'd like just to share a few words about Isaiah the prophet and some of the things that, uh, that he has to say to us today on a spiritual level before um, Bishop Alan brings a, a secondary and another address, a second address. And then we'll hear from one of our students before we confer the degrees. Isaiah was a prophet that was unlike any other prophet in terms of his scope and message. He lived under the <clears throat> menace of the empire of Assyria. He lived in a society that was declining and it had lost its way. The nation of Israel had lost its way, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And Assyria was in an expansionist mode for evil and the history of Israel always comes from the north. And so Assyria was expanding under Sennacherib and some other despots of that time. And Isaiah was out warning the people of God in Israel who had turned from, from their righteous ways. They turned from God and they'd gone their own ways. They'd gone after idolatry. And of course this is always a danger for every society that has ever lived uh, in the history of mankind. Idolatry is something that um, I think uh, many theologians have seen and told us is is something that uh, anything can become an idol for us. It can become anything other than the true and the living God. Our professions can be an idol to us. Um, for some, sex can be an idol. For some, possessions can be an idol. Anything can be an idol to us. And so God calls us to himself because God loves us. God calls us to be created as new creations in his image and not our own image. 
Well, Isaiah stands as a shadow in the light, um, and he points to a one who is coming. And one of the scriptures that that really uh, I felt had something to do with us today is the 40th chapter of Isaiah the prophet. Some have even said that Isaiah the prophet his uh, was um, two people or three people, but actually. He just changed his message because I remember the Dead Sea Scrolls when I when I saw them, which were ancient manuscripts of Isaiah, and I saw the Isaiah Scroll when I was about 16 years of age at Claremont University, where they were on display. And that's a long time ago. That's over 50 years ago for me now, and it, it seems uh, it goes fast, doesn't it, sir? It goes real fast. But at that time, I saw the Isaiah scroll, and it was one scroll, and I remember I was reading the scroll, trying to figure out the Hebrew characters, because I had an interest in Hebrew even then. But I remember the, the, the passage which started off, Nachmu, Nachmu, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak. Alev, to the heart of Yerushalayim, Jerusalem. Cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And the voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert and highway for your God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of Yahweh, the Lord, shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. The voice said, Kara, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, came back the answer, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the spirit of Yahweh bloweth upon it, and surely the people is grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord lasts forever. Isn't that good news? It's good when we look back at those flowers and look at the grass outside and even the moss, which seems to be everlasting around here. It's good to know that it passes away and that there's something in the world that never passes away. The word of the Lord. And the souls of men and women like you and me. And what we have here in Isaiah the prophet, whose name means salvation is of Yahweh. It's a reverse of the name Yeshua, meaning Yahweh is salvation. What we have here is a picture of God reaching out in love toward us. Now, why do I talk about this on graduation day at a commencement exercise? Well, it's because these three people that sit before you today have put a lot of effort into this book, both the Old and the New Testaments, and they have focused upon the person and work of God who loves us. That is quite a person to commit one's life to. The God of the Old Covenant and the God of the New Covenant. We see Old and New Covenant because God was not one who just looks from on high and watches us struggle down here God is the one who comes down 
and bends the knee to help his children. That's where Judaism and Christianity can come together in the faith of Abraham. He comes down and bends the knee. And in the course of study that we have through the seminary as well as through the scola, we have that message where God becomes man and God is in every verse or versicle of the Holy Scriptures showing himself to be the one who wishes to comfort us or speak to our hearts. Speak to the heart of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem for us is the city of peace. It's not so peaceful today, is it? If you look at what's going on in the world today, I don't think it's had peace in thousands of years. But we know that God has things for that in store for that city that are wonderful, even after great trials that will come to this earth. But God's promises are true. I have in my office up in Montana, that is my cell over on my bed, and I got it down here one year when I was here, and it says God keeps his promises. And I'm so thankful that we serve the God that does keep his promises because he's made plenty of them. And these folks have studied them. They've read and they've listened, they've meditated upon and they've prayed over and they've contemplated, which is what Lectio Divina or divine reading is all about in terms of the study method that we use at the Scola and for the courses in biblical theology. But it just doesn't stop there. The, the study doesn't stop with just studying and listening and reading and meditating on and contemplating. It has to come to a practical level. And the practical level is what difference does it make in your life? What difference does it make for you and how you are walking with God? Does it make a difference in that you're walking differently and that you're acting differently and that you're looking at Christ and others differently? Or are we just a bunch of hypocrites that are just saying one thing and doing another, which we never want to do? Oh yes, we may slip and fall. We may not be exactly everything we ought to be at any moment. But we need to recognize that when that's happening and repent, that is turn around and change our life and manner of living with the help of God who is there able to help us through that. So that's what it's about. It's about what you've learned is not an ending process. It is a process which goes on until the day that you draw your last breath. And that's what life is for all of us. It's God's pedagogical process. It's his process to bring us into relationship with his love, with his purpose, and with who he is. As Christians, we believe that to be the eternal son of God, the eternal son of the Father. God, Emmanuel, became one with us. And yet he reveals himself in so many ways. We have not arrived. None of us have arrived. I once heard this little thing of a confessor named Lester. There once was a confessor named Lester whose knowledge grew lesser and lesser. It at last grew so small. He knew nothing at all. So they made him a seminary professor. (laughs) And that's what they thought of me sometimes. (laughs) None of us have arrived. And this Lester here, and you Lesters, and you Lesters, will never arrive in this world. The longer I live, the more I know that I don't know 
the more that I long to love God, the more I have to say to God at the end of every day, Lord, I love you, but I love you so little compared to the love that you show to us. And so with this knowledge, we need to seek God's humility. Believe me, live long enough, and you'll get the humility. Because God has a way of knocking us down a little bit, does he not? And that's good. I'm going to close my remarks with just some words from one of the Psalms. Psalm 124, we use this and say this in our divine office. And I love this psalm. Every time I I hear it and I read it, I gain something new from it every time. And I gain something new from it yesterday and the day before and the day before. But let's see if we can gain something new in our own hearts right now. This is speaking of Israel, and remember it's Israel that went through the Holocaust, the Shoah, where six million Jews, God's chosen people, died in terrible concentration camps. But there were millions and millions more who were Christians and other people who had a conscience who died as well alongside of them. But Israel speaks for the whole human race, and we're all sort of in a Shoah or a Holocaust right now. We have 60 million unborn that have been killed, not to mention the world wars and the wars that are coming. 